Let's start with a quick show of hands. Who here has ever used a polling booth? Okay, so a few, few Democrats in the building. Has anyone ever used an electronic voting system of any kind? I'd be really impressed if anyone here had. Does that count like uh, Sex and Needs Your Favourite Game Show or whatever it is? Yes, technically. Uh, I, I think with formal secure voting systems, we're going to discount game shows. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, but, uh, and that, that's actually yeah. a very good point because what I'm covering here is a secure voting system, something that's usable for serious processes like democracy. Yeah, yeah, sure, yeah, yeah. So I'm going to cover a few of the shortcomings of current electronic voting systems, but what I'm, what I'm covering here is not, because obviously we have decentralized organizations on, in blockchains, we have simple smart contracts that can do simple voting, but what we want to add here is specific properties so we can use it for a very secure system. So, for a secure voting system, um, the reason why we use a ballot box, um, we, we need to have four properties, or we should have four properties. So first, we want to have anonymity. We don't want to see it, who Joe Schmo voted for, basically. We don't want to know if he's a UKIP voter, we don't want to know if he's a Labour voter, we don't want to know any of that. That's all private between him and, him and the ballot box. Uh, secondly, we want security, so we only want eligible voters, registered voters, to be able to vote. Um, we only want them to be able to vote once. Um, verify, uh, sorry, uh, yeah, we want the vote, we want the count to be correct. We want every, every vote for one candidate to come out as a vote for that candidate. We don't want any adulteration of the votes, so we want them to be, you know, publicly verifiable. Um, we also want a, a, a property that would be really good would be verifiability. The problem we have with systems at the moment, when you go to the ballot box and you take a, you take a box and you hand your, your ballot in, how do you know that your vote's been counted? We don't, we don't currently know this when we go to the ballot box. I mean, obviously, there's people counting the votes. Yeah, OK, we have some we have feasible, feasible systems for doing so. But we don't actually have public verifiability of our democracy. And if you're, in, if you're in the US, you probably won't be counted. <laughs> there you go. So, so how do we vote at the moment? So there's some pros and cons for the paper ballot system. There's, a re there's, re there's very important reasons why we still use it. So one of the pros, and this ties into our verification, our security, is that it's in-person verified. You, you go up to your polling booth, which is probably a church or something, um, and, and there'll be someone sitting there with a list of constituents, a list of names, and they'll check your ID to make sure you are who you are, and they'll tick it off, which is a very labor-intensive process, but it's the best we have at the moment for doing what we want to do. If you were to forge the paper ballot system as it is today, you can think how many paper ballots go into even one ballot <coughs> box. You think how difficult it would be to either replace them or take them all out, and sign a load of crosses on them. The, the reason why paper ballots are still in use in most places around the world is because is because they're so difficult to forge, it's so labor intensive to forge all that sort of stuff. And there's so many people around, like I don't understand how you'd feasibly be, be able to do that. I'm sure it happens, but it's a, it's a pretty good system for what we have. Um, one very interesting thing about paper ballots is that the counting is actually dis distributed across multiple nodes, if you will. But they're not actually nodes, they're just multiple people counting. But this means that one malicious, in one malicious indiv indiv individual, one malicious person counting can only have a certain effect on the outcome, even if they were to be malicious. And even so, if there were to be a recount or something, their maliciousness would be fairly obvious. So that's that's what I'm one of the pros of the count system we have at the moment. Um, so there are some cons to the system, and this is what a lot of people who are really keen on electronic voting say all the time. It's very economically costly, you need to produce the ballot box, you need to produce the ballot papers, it's very time intensive. I mean, for one person, yeah, it's an afternoon of manning a polling station or an evening of counting ballots, but if you times that by the amount of people involved in the vote, and also the, all the voters having to vote, having to go, travel to a physical location and travel back from that physical location, you probably quite a large time investment, a lot of man hours used there. Um, and another thing, as I was saying before, the results aren't publicly verifiable. You tick your box and you hope that the vote is counted, basically. Um, so what are some of the potentials of electronic voting? So ever since the advent of computing, people have been really keen on doing a secure electronic voting system. The reasons for this is because it would be very 
it would reduce a lot of costs economically and time speaking. Because, for example, we all have a computer in our pocket now. Why can't I pull out my smartphone and both? Um, Another factor with that is, if there was an app on my smartphone that I could use to just pull out and vote, that means that a lot more people, I think, would vote. That's my hypothesis anyway. I don't know, I don't, I don't know what would actually happen there. But I think there's a loss of engagement because there's not only an economic cost involved in going to a physical polling booth, but there's also a time cost. So yeah, another thing is electronic voting. If we don't have people physically counting ballots, we can avoid human error, which is really good. Because even if someone is an honest counter of ballots, I'm sure the amount of ballots they go through, and some of them they count so fast, I bet there's some human error involved there. So it's, it's not, it's, that's not the end of the world, but it's certainly not desirable. Um, so problems with electronic voting. The reason why electronic voting isn't as widespread as maybe we'd like it to be. Um, is the software and hardware correct, robust, and secure? If you know anything about software development, the answer is always no. And that's, that's, that's a shame, but that's the way it is. Um, no matter how, how right your software and hardware seems, there's going to be a time down the road when someone finds a security vulnerability. So that's one of the main reasons, I think, why electronic voting has been used for wide, widespread. Um, so another thing is, increasing the convenience of the system, the convenience of the data stored in the system, you increase the convenience of being able to manipulate that data. Like I was saying, the paper ballot system is feasibly unfabricatable because you have physical ballots which are like, cumbersome, you have to physically mark the ballots, and they all have to be marked differently, all this sort of stuff. Um, if, if, the, if your vote is just a one in a system, then it's very easy to change that one to a zero, or to change one of your zeros to a one, for example. So that's another, that's another reason. Um, yeah, so in the examples of Brazil and stuff where they do have certain electronic voting systems, all the hardware and software involved that I know of, please correct if I'm wrong, I'll find up examples, but it's been closed source. Now, I don't know how much you guys know about closed source, open source, but this essentially means that we don't have access to the code that's in that, in that box, which isn't great. In some, in some cases, even, even the governments don't have access to the code inside that box. They just get a piece of software and ship to them. Um, verification is also an issue, um, because you're not going in person, I mean, I've already had a flagged up that there's maybe not the best due process with this sort of in-person verification, but there's, but there's they've been attempts for, to use ID passages before, and they've been shown to be forgeable. Um, <coughs> because they have, they have, they have these ID cards, they have like a small chip in them that identifies you, and but people have managed to crack it and vote as another person and all this sort of stuff. So that, that hasn't gone so well in the past. Um, and again, all the electronic voting systems we've, that, that have been tried, as far as I'm aware, the results of the election are not publicly verifiable. We still can't check as the public that the voting authority is telling the truth as to what they've received. So, blockchain is cool new technology. What can we do with blockchain? What does blockchain offer? So, and this is, this is theoretically, I, I've given as a caveat down here, this assumes a stable network, this assumes correct, correct blockchain software. So take that as a caveat before you start shouting out, this didn't work on my network. Um, so we theoretically have immutable data through a consensus mechanism. So everyone consents that what is on the blockchain is correct, and we all agree to, to keep that record. Um, we, we could use this. Um, to have inalterable ballot data, which would be really great. It's not as easy as manipulating the one and zero anymore. You have to manipulate the one to the one to a zero across the entire network. Um, with something like Ethereum, we can do smart contracts. So why don't we have the, the ballot code, the logic for the ballot, why don't we have it on the blockchain as well? Not only is that technically kind of open source because it's available to anyone, but the computing is going to be done across all the nodes as opposed to just one, one piece of hardware. That could be, you know, a compromise or something. Um, another thing is we have an egalitarian network. When you pay your fees on a blockchain system, generally speaking, you're treated the same as the other, the other um, transactions. I know it's not always the case, but that's that's a theoretical point that we can make, I suppose. So we can overcome some of the issues I'd said with the previous electronic voting with this with this new technology. 
So, one cool thing about the blockchain space, if you will, is that all the major players are open source. Bitcoin's open source, Ethereum's open source. We can, we can look at the code, we can check the underlying technology before we start building any smart contracts or anything on top of it. It's all open source, we can check that it does what we want it to do. It has a public private key system for verification. I, I can generate a private key for my, my address, and that belongs to me now. Feasibly, I mean, you can look into the chances of there being a collision on that system, but um, I don't know how deep you want to get into cryptography, but that's incredibly unlikely. Um, yeah, and I, as a caveat there, I've given security prompts. Yeah, okay, blockchain systems, Bitcoin, Ethereum, they've got great public-private key systems, as long as you're competent with your security. With the response, of, with the with the power of, of being in control of, I guess people say being your own bank sort of thing, or the, the, with the responsibility that comes with being in control of your pub, private key, you need to make sure that key is secure, or else it's no good basically. Um, okay, so what are we? What, what else is up? Okay, we have the useful data, of course, but also the chain data is publicly available to anyone who wants it. Now this means if we can do some sort of encryption scheme and make sure that the, um, the public can verify what the authority is telling them is the result, is the result, potentially. Um, and yeah, it's a mutable data, manipulated data across networks, quite improbable, especially the deeper blocks you go. So, okay, let's build a balancing system. What, what is the control flow of our system going to look like? Okay, so, Simply put, we want our voting authority to be able to initialize a ballot. We want to tell our voters where the ballot is on the blockchain. We want them to execute their vote, and then we want to tally the vote. Very simple, low resolution image of what we want to do. Um, so Ethereum. Why did I choose Ethereum to build this solution? So first of all, we have a stable network like Bitcoin. So generally speaking, we have immutable data. Yeah, we can talk about the DAO and I do it the next slide, so for anyone's chance I'm here. Um, we have mutable computing. When we submit something to be computed, we know it will be computed and be computed correctly. That's good. Um, has the Turing complete language, so we could do <coughs> things I was talking about before in terms of doing our ballot logic on the, on the blockchain within within across the nodes. Um, and yeah, with the Ethereum technology, not only is it compatible with the Ethereum network, if you're really keen on immutable data, you can go and use the Ethereum Classic network if you want. You could make your own private network if you're into permission blockchains and stuff, and you're absolutely insane. Um, or in my case, you can just run it on a single node if you're developing, which is really convenient. So that's why I chose to do it. It does have some problems. Um, so yeah, like I said, we have stuff like the DAO hard forks, which shows the power of the consensus mechanism in terms of revoking immutability, which isn't always great. Um, will Ethereum always have value, or Bitcoin always have value? Are we going to have financial incentives to secure our network? Um, and a couple of issues I ran into while developing was that the premier language for Ethereum that I developed the ballot contract in, Solidity, pardon me. <coughs> um, the maximum integer size is 256 bits. When I encrypt a value with my encryption scheme, it comes out as a 2048 bit number. So I had to split it up into a, an array of data, which was no fun, but it has to be done. Um, and it's missing a few high-end functions there, which would have been really useful, but we can, we can do some workarounds for now. Um, yeah, an example. Um, so I, I, I give the voter addresses, and I push them into the, the voters array. It's not as easy as going voters equal this voters in. You have to actually loop through them in the solidity because you know, they're very conservative with what features they want offer, which is understandable, but this is what you can do with current technology. Um, so encryption, I broke the cardinal sin of doing anything secure, and I rolled my own encryption. Uh, why? Well, because uh, as I was saying, it's an academic project, I wanted to challenge myself to see if I could do it. And I needed a crypt system with a property called homomorphism, which is a ridiculously long word, which I will come back to and explain, don't worry. Um, yeah, and I guess you could replace it with another scheme if you wanted to change the code more. Um, so the Polycrypt system is similar to RSA, based off of RSA, if anyone knows about that. I am assuming pretty knowledge here. I hope I'm not you know, keeping anyone behind. Uh, it's got public-private key, similar to how blockchain works. Actually, no, exactly how blockchain works, isn't it? 
So, and it has this property of partial homomorphism that we really want. So, what is homomorphism? Why, why, why was I so keen on using it? So, homomorphism is a property for a cryptographic scheme where operations like add, plus, divide, multiply can be carried out on the crypt, the crypt tech, the ciphertext, sorry. And then when you decrypt the final value, you get the operation applied to the two plain text values. Now, I don't think anyone's ever devised a fully homomorphic encryption scheme, because that's a bit mental. Uh, gentry. Talk, talk, to me afterwards. Yeah. talk to me afterwards. Mm -hmm. um, so the pedo encryption scheme achieves partial homomorphism, meaning you can add and subtract by multiplying and dividing given the public key. So this means we can give out the public key, um, and anyone can calculate the ciphertext of the result. They don't get the result, they get the ciphertext. So we're, we, we kind of have half verifiability there. So the voting authority can. Uh, no, slide actually. Um, so the simple example here. This is what this is what the voters voted as. This is what the result is. So a voter can go to the voting authority and say, okay, we're going to do the homomorphic ads, add all these together, and get the ciphertext of the result. And I can compare my ciphertext result against your ciphertext result. Good, it works. I don't have to give you the private key. We both have the same result there. Now, the voting authority takes the, the private key, the secret one, and decrypts and shows, shows them the result. Now, it's not perfect. There is kind of some trust there still, but it's a good step in the direction of being able to have a publicly verifiable ballot. Um, yeah, it, it, this is essentially what I just said. So, um, just a little bit more interesting information about the keys. Um, um, I hard coded the keys in this project to 1024 bit. I do plan before I hand it in to make it variable, or maybe at a later date. Um, they're derived from 512 bit prime numbers that um, I have a, a system random number generator in the software. And I do a, a couple miller rabin tests to probabilistically check that the prime numbers are prime. Um, you can't actually check every number and factor up to those numbers because that would take you a very long time to do. Um, so yeah, here we have the, the logic in the ballot contract, basically. Um, I'm, I'm sorry if you can't see, actually. Um, so on, on the program side, um, the, the Python program I built, the vote selects a candidate. They, it, it calls the contract on the blockchain, which can, which can give its public key out to voters, or anyone who asks for it, really. Um, the voters then use that to encrypt their vote, and they send it off in a transaction to the ballot contract. Now, there's some code to the ballot contract that goes, is the voter eligible? Is their address in the list of voters? If it's yes, carry on. Is the, has the voter already voted? There's a mapping which you can give it an address, and it'll say true or false if the voter's already voted. They haven't already voted good. Is the vote data in the right format? In this case, 248-bit values once they're encrypted. Um, if, if it's all in the right format, then add it to the results. Um, and, there's, and there's the code that I have a good set for it, but I don't want to you. And um, it, I'm, I don't know if they're posting these on the, the website, these slides, but I'll, they'll be on my personal site if anyone can check them out. Um, ah, this is, yeah. So this is, this is just a demo. And I, OK. so. I, the, the demo is just a thing of working anyway, which is where it's all about. Um, so basically, what I built is a Python program on the front end and the ballot contract on the back end. Is, um, and what, basically, what, what goes on in this demo is I give the title of the ballot, I give the description of the ballot, I give the candidates, I give the, all the voters, deploys that, waits for the block to be mined, um, and then I loop through, I, I basically just do all my all my voter addresses and vote for the candidates, and then I tally the results at the end. Um, so yeah, as I said, there's there's quite a few shortcomings with this project. Um, as as anyone who knows a little bit about Ethereum, um, the gas costs grow with the amount of data you want to blockchain, the amount of computing you want to do. Um, with a large amount of number of voters, for example, if you wanted to do a government vote, you need a ridiculous quite a large amount of money, but that's just what is available with the current technology if you want to use a stable network, unfortunately. 
Um, and I've also run into some issues where there is a gas limit on the Ethereum network, and if you hit that, you won't even take your transactions there. So those are some shortcomings at the moment, with um, not only just this product, but also with the technology that's available in general. Um, another thing, we need to check the spoiled or invalid balance. Because there, we take them in encrypted values, they could be any values. Um, before I hand this in, I, I plan to have a feature for a user that deliberately sends a small ballot, and I plan to implement um, a feature where when you tally the ballots, it ignores spoiled ballots. Um, um, there's some research done into the anonymizing addresses. I think, uh, I can't remember who the speaker was two speakers ago, but he was talking about a little bit. There's a lot of interesting papers, a lot of companies that put a fair bit of money into de anonymizing things like Bitcoin, for example. So, uh, that's another possible shortcoming, but that's more to do with technology. Um, yeah, as I was saying, there's an economic cost for voters. Not only do you need to have uh, users to run this on, you also need to uh, pay the transaction fee. Um, another thing, you need to know all the addresses that you're initializing the ballot. I, I do plan to have something where you can initialize the ballot add as many addresses as you want at any time, and then have another function where you start the ballot now, and it ends about two weeks from now. But that's something I'm going to be developing over the next couple of months before I have it. So the project is on my GitHub, anyone's particularly interested in the code. Um, like I said, I'm probably going to put the slides, and if you guys are really interested in seeing the demo, that will probably be on my personal site as well. So we got through it. Thanks very much.